Hi everyone, I am Joshua Friedman, news editor at Rappaport. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us and welcome to our latest webinar, uh, the second in a series of webinars titled Fast Tracking the Future, brought to you by IGI, the International Gemological Institute. The last webinar hosted by our senior analyst, Abby Kravitz, on the topic of lab-grown diamonds, which you can still watch on the uh, on the Rappaport YouTube page, is, is going to be quite a hard act to follow. It was a very heated debate. Uh, the topic of today's webinar is maybe a little less controversial, but the issues are just as cutting edge and important. And I can assure you that there's also a lot of money uh, at stake in the, uh, in the market that we're going to be discussing. Fancy shaped diamonds is the topic of this webinar. Um, fancy shaped diamonds are big sellers in the US market and have also mushroomed in popularity in, in recent years. Why has that happened? Well, consumers want something different. They want something unique. Um, but also manufacturers are getting better at making nice fancy cuts and also, also the, the grading labs are getting better at grading them. Um, talking of grading, uh, just to introduce our sponsor, our sponsor is IGI, which operates 20 laboratory locations around the world, grading finished jewelry, natural diamonds, lab-grown diamonds and gemstones, and also runs 14 gemology schools. Uh, this session is very topical indeed because IGI recently launched a cut grade for fancy shaped diamonds, becoming one of just a tiny number of labs that, uh, that offer such a thing. So today we're going to explore the key issues around this topic. What is, uh, what, what is uh, the, the, the reason for this demand for fancy shaped diamonds? Um, what, are, what, what are the main shapes that are in demand? And um, how important is grading to the industry? And uh, finally, how has, uh, how has the latest technology changed the industry, particularly the impact of lab-grown diamonds, the impact of automation? Um, so thanks everyone for joining us. I'd like to start by welcoming our panelists. Um, firstly, Nilesh Chabria, uh, Nilesh Chabria is Chief Operating Officer at <laughs> Fine Star Jewelry and Diamonds, a polished manufacturer based in Mumbai, India, which has a large focus on fancy shaped diamonds. Nilesh holds an MBA and overseas Fine Star strategy. Welcome, Nilesh. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's an absolute uh, honor and privilege to be a part of this uh, great team. And, uh, you know, it's amazing to be having John and Avi to come and discuss. Uh, about fancy shapes, so we're all uh, excited about it. Great, me too. Um, our next panelist is Avi Freundlich. Uh, Avi has been cutting and polishing fancy shaped diamonds since he was a child, as we will hopefully hear shortly. And um, originally from Israel, Avi is now based on the west coast of the US uh, as a diamond director and uh, and buyer for jewelry brand Takori and CEO of AF Special Diamonds, a diamond dealer in Los Angeles, welcome, Abby. Hi, well, thank you for having me here. Um, it's a pleasure. I'm in the industry, like uh, you said, for a very long time, from childhood. <laughs> um, I will be happy to share my uh, knowledge and uh, experience with you guys today. Great. And finally, uh, John Pollard joined IGI earlier this year as its Senior Director of Education. A GIA graduate, he was previously an independent consultant for the trade on topics related to diamonds, grading, and gemology, working with the IGI on many projects. Um, so to begin with, um, we will be taking, just so everyone knows, in the last 15, 20 minutes or so, we will be taking uh, selected questions. So if anyone has any, any questions, please make sure you post them in the Q&A section on the Zoom app. Uh, don't post them in the, in the chat because we may not see them if you post them there. Um, but obviously everyone is welcome to chat about any topic they want in the, in the chat. Um, so let's, let's start off with a, uh, a broad perspective on this market. We have some people in this panel, as we've mentioned, who have been active in the sector for many, many decades. So let's start off with you, Avi. Um, if I understood correctly, your parents brought you up cutting fancy diamonds in the in the Tanya in Israel when you were a small child, yes. correct? How, how, has, correct. Uh, how has the market changed since then? Oh, that's uh, dramatically. 
Uh, this is, we're talking about the uh, end of uh, the 80s that uh, I used to go after school and in the summer break to help my both parents in the factory. They used to do labor for some big firm in Israel. Um, that time when I start, uh, they teach me how to cut fancy shape. We st I start from fancy shape. It was in the beginning from some step cut, which was a baguette, taper, and then it went to all the other fancy shape, which was marquee, oval, pear shape, heart shape. Uh, the technology at that time, we used to do everything by the eye. Like what we used to judge the polish, the symmetry, the proportion of the stones that we used to build. Mostly what used to be by the eye. Uh, on the things that handling the diamond, which we call dop, it was just, have uh, in that time we didn't even have the things that giving you the degrees of the angles on the, the things. It used to be like a copper that you just uh, bending. So since then it did uh, a long way and today everything is really, really accurate. Uh, you have uh, machinery and uh, computers from all this company, like uh, all the way from Sarin, Ogi, that um, helping you to be really correct in the cutting. If it's, we're talking about the angles, if we're talking about the polish and symmetry that uh, this machinery giving you the best solution and helping you how to plan the stones from the beginning to the end. So technology really improved it. And um, any stones that coming uh, today in the manufacturer side, in the minute that they putting it on the sarim, it's also pump up what is the order that you have that these stones gonna be matched to. So technology change all the, all the business. You have also the, today we have also laser, for a long time already, we have laser machines that helping a lot with the shapes. The shapes are more accurate because of the laser machines that uh, we're using in the industry. Uh, it's, the, the changing is uh, from anim, from anim, drastic. So I, I think we're, um, we're gonna zoom in a little bit more on, uh, on, on the technology side uh, later on, but uh, just uh, on, on the, on the issue of demand for fancy shapes, and Nilesh, I had a question for you because you, um, we actually we we interviewed you for Rappaport magazine last year, um, and you said that fancy shaped diamonds now accounted for uh, sixty percent of your polished production at, at at your company at Fine Star, and I think that compared with five percent in twenty fifteen. That's that's quite a change. That's quite a shift towards uh, towards fancy shapes. Uh, Nilesh, what uh, what drove that that move for you? <clears throat> so Joshua, um, when we, I, if I start from the year of 2015, as we were talking about, um, we were, if I looked at my polish stock at any given point in time, it was 98% rounds and 2% and fancies. Um, and and with we realizing that, you know, with so much competition in round and, you know, typically with so many being around, um, a manufacturer like me, if I have to bring in some kind of value addition to the, to my production and to what my brand is, we needed to head towards a more um, an approach towards the fancy shapes. And that's what we started doing. And we started exploring the fancy shapes slowly and steadily trying to understand. And we, uh, with the help of what exactly Avi was talking about, how technology has done a brilliant job for us in terms of not just in the sector of, in, in the sector of manufacturing, but every process of manufacturing from all the way from procurement to planning to manufacturing all the way to selling. Technology does a lot to, for, for us. And today, if you're looking at, as you said, um, you know, um, we're sitting at 60% fancy shapes and 40% rounds in 2022. Um, the, there are two, two actual factors. It's obviously internal that, you know, over a period of time with the help of technology, we've been able to do a lot with exploring the different ways that we can cut the diamonds in the best possible fashion to get the best uh, light refraction and uh, light performance for the stones. Um, this was from our end um, when it comes to the fact of the manufacturing part of it, how we exploded and we made it better and the, the fire and the luster of the stone became just amazing. But now when it comes to the external factor, there has been a huge demand in 
polished diamonds or all these new fancy shapes. Um, and, and, it's, uh, and it's also got to do with how people want to express their individuality. They want to have a style statement towards it. And, and with the help of these uh, celebrities who are donning these amazing engagement rings, all, all of them have a different style statement. If you look at an Ariana Grande's, um, Ariana Grande's engagement ring, which typically has a, you, a oval with a pearl shape, which is so unique. You know, so stuff like this and, and with, with people trying to express the millennials wanting to get into the more luxury products. So all of these internal and external factors have created a special market share for our business and the demand has been created. And for those reasons, Weinstor also had to move in that direction. And now today we have 60% fancy shapes in our stock. Great. Well, Nilesh, you touched on a lot of the topics that we're going to be discussing today, I hope. Um, just... Uh... Uh, moving to, to John, I, I, I wanted to ask a little about the um, the background from your perspective. We, we think today in terms of this kind of dichotomy of round <clears throat> and fancies, um, has, has it always been like that? Has there always been those two distinct markets? Well, I think you can look back and, and first of all, I want to acknowledge uh, what Avi and Nilesh have said and say that we've got uh, things aligning with the technology sector and, of course, differentiation for producers, uh, individualization, Generation Z, etc. cetera. Um, we should remember the brilliant style of faceting took off during the Georgian and Victorian eras. Like that was when old mines were becoming more round and then old European cuts gained prominence uh, as cutting tools improved and gas lamps gave way to electric lighting. We evolved around brilliant, and that was sort of the evolution of the species for a long time. Um, it's also a matter of economics. Most natural diamond rough is well suited to the round shape, so it has proved historically to be more profitable for producers. But now, as the other gentlemen have said, we do have a number of factors combining, and we are seeing an explosion in the interest um, and demand for fancies. Right. Um... So that's um, th these are all in in interesting points that everyone's made. Um, I, I want to um, actually just for a bit just focus on some of the you know, really the the recent demand for for fancy shapes. So the, we've seen um, obviously quite a volatile market in general in, in diamonds in the last basically since since the beginning of this year. Um, Nilesh, how has the fancy shapes market performed specifically this year? Has it has it has it weathered some of the difficulties that the market that the general market has seen, and what's what's uh, what's the performance been like? Um, uh, Joshua, the thing is that when it comes to fancy shapes, um, you know, uh, as as Fine Star, we we manufacture typically larger fancy shapes, and and what we've seen in in yes, there has been a little dampened uh, in in sales in the last few months that it's been it's been with everybody. But just because you know making larger, finer cut, uh, fancy shapes is very uh, not that readily available as compared to the rounds, and for that reason, um, you know, they the fancy shape has still created, uh, held on to its uh, little its demand, and today also I'm not feeling the pinch when it comes to my larger fancy shapes, but I'm, I may feel a pinch with the other shape with with the round pro probably. Um, and 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 even the, from the pricing post perspective, um, fancy shape larger stones are holding on the pricing pretty well. So it's not uh, we're not being hurt that badly from that perspective. And Nilesh, we know that certain that the rough that's that that is used to produce certain fancy shapes um, originates in in Russia, um, and that has obviously raised some some, some supply questions. Um, has that how has that impacted availability of uh, of of fancy fancy shaped goods? Um, um, in the rough of Russia has impacted in a way that you know obviously there has been a, a drop of approximately twenty to twenty five percent rough in in the market at this point in time. So the availability of rough is going to be a problem in the coming times as well. Um, fortunately, the season time's coming, so the po polished pile up that everybody has. There will be a movement that is going to come along, but then it's going to be a little if issue for everybody to create that kind of availability with other stones. So for obviously reasons, 
that we, in fact, I feel believe that this season you will get a chance to, uh, there'll be an incremental price in probably fancy ships. Right. Um, Avi, I, I believe you, um, your, your focus is more on the smaller, sm smaller yes. sizes of fancy shapes. Correct. Um, how, um, I'm actually curious to know in, in that, in that category, what, what are the most popular, what are the most popular fancy shapes and why? Uh, the demand in the small sizes, uh, today, uh, if we're talking about from, uh, let's say, first of all, from half a car down, it's going to be a little bit surprised for people probably, but marquee is the, my opinion is the most demand and supply in Marquis, it's pretty short compared to the demand in the market. In some sizes, the Marquis, it's uh, price-wise, it's stronger from round in the same category. If you're going to the higher ends, which fancy shape in small sizes, selling better in the, that's the difference between round and fancy. In, in fancy shape, uh, prices are, first of all, prices are very stiff. They are still very strong because of the demand and supply is not as much as uh, the market needs. And um, in, the, in what I can say about uh, price wise, you have some like marquee, I say, like I mentioned marquee in six per carat marquee, for example, if I'm going to specification, it's stronger from round. It's not happening usually in fancy shape. Oval that used to be very popular in the last couple of years, slowing down in the last couple of months. Pearship is more in demand. Emerald is small, more in demand. Um, it's the trend changing it. Uh, basically what changing the demand in the small sizes, my opinion, is the biggest company, the big company, uh, the big company and the designers in the industry which uh, like Tiffany, Cartier, and et cetera, like the leaders with the advertising and style that coming up, things that catch in the market, changing the demand. So oval that used to be very demand in small sizes, it slowed down compared to pear shape, especially front of the marquee that uh, coming back big time. Um, that's what... Uh, I can say about uh, the demand in the small sizes. Um, you were also in matching pair of uh, matching pair of uh, special cut that uh, we seeing more and more in the last 10, 15 years, uh, which is can can be like the trapezoid that going to engagement ring, trapezoid, um, half moons and all etc. These uh, side stones that are uh, really popular also today. Not only they are going not only with uh, diamond rings, they are going very well also with uh, color stone centers. Thank you, Abby. Uh, uh, John, um, you are you're based you're, you're joining us from Texas, I believe. Um, but if you, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to ask a global question. Um, we we generally understand that that uh, fancy shape diamonds are popular in the US um, for various reasons. And if you go outside the US, which to China, for example, you'll find much less demand for fancy shapes. Um, do you agree with that? Do you have any reasons, why, any explanations for that? And, and does what you see as a, as a grading lab match that? Not specific to China, but we pulled our worldwide locations and uh, outside the USA, there's been steady growth in fancies in all sectors. Um, from 2018 to 2020, the growth ranged from 12 to 15 percent year on year. And in 2021, it jumped by 100 percent. And this year, the growth is not quite so much, but we expect it to increase around um, 60 percent again if the trend continues. Right. And um, John, this this demand for for fancies. I mean, we know it's been said many times that one of the well, one of the drivers behind diamond demand is is the um, is a long term value retention. Um, do you feel that fancies maintain their value to the same extent that the round brilliants do? Well, I would ask one of the other gentlemen to con comment on value. We're um, we're grading them. Um, in terms of long-term value, I could make personal observations, but I think the other guys have more expertise there. 
Nilesh, what's your view on this? Um, the thing is, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, we're seeing because of uh, the demand that is across, it's not just for the US market, but we're feeling across in the Asian market as well. Um, in terms of value, um, the amount, uh, the, from a cost perspective, I feel it is, uh, from a pricing perspective, we can pull the same kind of price globally. So it's not a, it's not a country specific pricing that we look at. Um, moreover, the fact that, you know, I saw a lot of, you know, these Chinese uh, market really trying to adapt to understanding fancy shapes. And I could see the movements of some emeralds and heart shapes and the pairs and cushions in that market. But unfortunately, because of this lockdown that came along and, you know, it's and the prolonged uh, situation that they're in. So I felt the <clears throat> market got which was going up uh, upscale in terms of consumption has now come to a stability. But the best part and the most unique thing that I saw in this year and the last two years was actually India consuming larger fancy shapes, which was I mean, which was not something which we were um, we were expecting, but it did. And, you know, I, I, and in fact, what we've been doing is we're making a lot of large stone fancy shapes, like typically five carat, seven carat, 10 carat emeralds, um, uh, pear shapes, um, ovals. And these stones are typically getting sold in India uh, because we're grading them with IGI as well. So, you know, uh, we, we're finding that uh, movement in India and somehow the, the market share that we had uh, with, with China and other European countries and other places where we're moving, all of a sudden India is just pumped up and created some more market share for themselves. Um, thank you, uh, John. I, I wanted to move on to the topic of um, the topic of grading. Uh, this is obviously an important topic. Um, and as I mentioned earlier on, you've just uh, just a few weeks ago you announced at IGI that you'd launched a, a cut grade for fancy shapes. Um, and this is something that, as we know, is is quite rare. That right, there are very few labs that are able to do this and it's much more complicated than for round brilliance um so john i, I wanted to ask you what why firstly why is it complicated why is it so much harder to give fancy shaped diamonds a cut grade and what have you done <clears throat> to, to solve this well light behavior in fancy shapes can't be predicted using proportions uh, in a round brilliant you essentially have three primary angles, girdle, culet, notwithstanding. You've got a table facet, you've got a primary crown angle and a primary pavilion angle. Uh, the physics of light behavior are consistent within a diamond. So if you know those three angles, then regardless of um, how you crosswork it and brilliant ear it, you know essentially that light that's going into the diamond is either going to reflect and return back to the viewer through the crown or it will window or leak out the bottom and escape. And you can predict this for rounds. But with fancy shapes, you have different tiers of proportions, different faceting configurations and different shapes. And so the variables uh, become unpredictable. So we can put a fancy shape on a sarin and, and get a scan and understand the measurements, but we can't necessarily know what light behavior is, is going to happen unless we were to make a 3D model of it and use ray tracing or, uh, or some other approach like that. I see, thank you. How, um, Nilesh, how do you believe uh, this, this type of development will affect the market? So from a, um, we, we had, uh, we've been uh, grading uh, fancy shaped stones internally for a very long time. And we have our own lab uh, in our own factory trying to uh, come up with our own cut grades. Um, but exactly like how uh, John was saying, you know, rounds have a specific proportions. And, uh, you know, when you, when you see light performance and light return performance, you exactly know how to figure that out. But when in fancy shapes, because uh, what's happening is that, um, you know, these manufacturers with, with the help of technology are, you know, uh, changing the faceting as well as the parameters in such a uh, high scale to get the best performance. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's difficult to define and say that, hey, this is the standard parameter for a specific shape. So that's why it's getting uh, complex for grading stones when it comes to fancy shapes. Now, with regards to um, how we do it internally is we typically have um, a fixed uh, you know, we have our, obviously I've got fixed parameters, but then we've got our internal technology with which helps with softwares. We've got softwares 
which are in 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 belts with our uh, internal um, manufacturing ERP systems, where we while even planning, we look into the light performance of a stone basis of not just light performance of the stone basis of a lot of things as well. Yeah. So once we do that, and while in during the manufacturing pro process, uh, we keep matching that with our light performance. And, you know, uh, and there's a lot of factors to our light performance that we consider. We look at brilliancy, we look at fire, we look at light, we look at uh, uh, scintillation, we look at optical symmetry, and all the bases having different percentages, we have inbuilt um, the, the whole data into our system, which helps us understand what percentage will create an excellent cut in our system. But that being very specific to ours. Today, even like a come today, like a lab with IGI was going to be coming into place for them to go specific with terms of how the grading has to be for a specific shape is going to be a big task because light performance, what an IGI would consider as a standard, what an AGS will consider as a standard or a GCAL would consider as a standard is quite different. So till the time we all as an industry come through an standardization of, pro uh, of proportions, and then as obviously John, John was talking about creating a 3D model to understand the study of the whole light performance going in and how much of refraction comes in from the crown, which you see it visually, is something which we need to all uh, come together and make it happen because it's the need of the hour. Because right now, fancy shape is no more a niche market and it's become uh, mainstream. Um, Avi, what's your perspective on how grading has developed over the years? Um, the, like I said in the beginning, the develop is amazing. Uh, you have to, like they talk, everybody talking about the light performance. Uh, it's changing from shape to shape, you know, in fancy shape. It's not like round. Round, all it's brilliant. And you talk about the proportion between the bottom part of the stones and the top part of the stone. In fancy shape, we have step cut stones, which is emerald cut, asher cut, baguette. In uh, the other stones that are brilliant cut, the light performance is behaving differently and have much better light performance. That, that is, doesn't mean that uh, classic stones like emerald cut is not good or you have to judge it differently. That's it. So if the, the if the only way that you, you really can do something special for the market, it's like what Miles said that uh, the standard gonna be more or less in the same, uh, it's gonna be the same standard for all the stones. You cannot judge all the stones the same, but you have to make some standard between the labs that uh, uh, light performance and uh, not judging only symmetry and polish, going to affect, uh, I think it's going to affect a lot uh, the fancy shape market. It did in the past in the round when the, the cut grade came into the picture. Sure. Um, John, the IGI has put out a, has a quite an interesting video about the, the, your new cut grade, which raises some well, two important points. One of them was the um, how how the perception of grades has changed and how at the beginning it used to be a um you, you would it was there to verify what you saw or isn't it well is that's kind of developed into you know, as you mentioned that's developed into people sort of almost trading uh, reports but you also mentioned that you're working on a a more i think the word was mechanical uh, method for um for grading uh, fancy fancy uh, fancy shape cut is, is that something you're able to expand on i can it's actually the opposite of that it's it's not mechanical um we first of all i'm going to i'll start and end with the statement i think we can all agree on um basic light behavior meaning whether light from the hemisphere entering a stone either windows out the bottom or reflects properly and comes back, we can judge that using a structured light environment. There's, there's a number of ways to, to judge that. We can see if, a, if the light entering a stone is returning or is windowing out the bottom. When we start getting into character, um, Avi absolutely mentioned something that, that was in front of us at IGI, uh, which is, look, a pear has a completely different appearance than an emerald cut. 
has a completely different appearance than a marquee. Um, so you've got these taste factors and these performance factors that are separate. When you add to that, some shapes are more brilliant with brilliant cuts, of course, and then, then step cuts and fire and scintillation vary. Not only that, but fire and scintillation are complex visual events. Um, our brain interprets three-dimensional events in all three dimensions thanks to binocular disparity or depth perception. So having two eyes, we also enjoy compound cognition, which means that our brain can perceive separate events as brighter than their actual intensity uh, thanks to that binocular disparity. The perception of some of these components are also influenced by pupil light reflex. The pupil dilates or constricts differently in different environments. These are some of the reasons that it's very difficult to, um, to support the integrity of mechanical grading. Um, you know, when you put a diamond in a machine and lights flash and, and you take a picture of it and try to uh, evaluate it. Those, are, those approaches don't have a physiological component. So as I said at the beginning, we went simpler than that. We, first of all, I'll, I'll start, start with step one, which is traditional polish and symmetry grading. We are looking at polish and symmetry, and if they're VG or X, then that fancy shape becomes a candidate for the, the excellent cut grade overall. The second step is kind of a looking back. We, we also, you know, we can come, we could design a system and say, this is the best way to cut a princess because our computers say it, but it doesn't respect what the trade has done for a century. And so what we've done is we've looked back and we've gathered the parametric data that our lab locations have historically observed to produce the most positive components. And we've established those ranges as guidelines. Now they're not a guarantee and they're liberal because of the inverse crown pavilion relationship. And you know, if you cut a pavilion angle a certain way uh, and a crown angle another way, then um, let's, let's say that they have great light return in the diamond. Well, once you start cutting the pavilion deeper, the crown needs to go shallower and vice versa. It's a simplification, but you get the idea. What we've done is we've provided these rangers so that producers can benefit from them and say, okay, that's what the lab has observed historically to be great. If it falls within those proportions ranges, then it remains a candidate for the excellent grade. The third step of four is we are applying additional requirements and those are shape specific. Uh, things like looking for bow tie and shapes, which, uh, which are affected by bow tie. Uh, things like looking at the, um, the rounded shoulders on certain shapes, et cetera, et cetera. So shape-specific additional requirements. If the diamond does not have a severe bow tie or has the, uh, passes the additional requirements, then it moves to, it remains a uh, candidate for excellent rather and moves to the last step. The last step is light return grading. It's not light performance grading, it's light return grading, meaning that we're not trying to assess fire or scintillation. We're using a standardized environment and looking at the stone to see if a lot of light windows out, if minimal light windows out or almost no light windows out. It's judging light return. If that shape has enough brightness, uh, and well, I shouldn't even say the term brightness, if it has enough light returning, to the viewer, uh, then it is conferred the grade of excellent. And if it doesn't, then uh, we confer a grade that's lower than that. I would compare this to uh, the grading of fluorescence, where we use a common viewing environment to judge whether the stone has negligible fluorescence, slight, strong, very strong. This is a similar look at windowing. Is the stone have negligible windowing? Is it slight? Is it strong or is it very strong? And that's essentially how the, the system operates. It's, it's not mechanical. Basically, we're going back to fundamentals and just seeing if the stone has good light return. Thank you. Um, so just a reminder to everyone that uh, there will at the end be a, um, a brief uh, session for, uh, in which the panelists will answer your questions. Uh, so if you do have any questions, just reminded to post them in the Q&A section. Um, not in the chat section, please. And we're going to move on to um, some of the other issues that we'd like to discuss today. Um, and I think one, one of them actually is uh, to do with uh, weight retention. Um, I'm going to ask this to Nilesh, I think. Uh, Nilesh, uh, we, my understanding is that in the past, fancy shapes were very much a... Um, 
so a, a way of, uh, of of maximizing or minimizing weight loss basically for when cutting a diamond um, and we know that this has changed um, and as you've said yourself that you know the pure demand for for fancy shapes has has increased significantly so how how has this aspect changed did you is, is is that still a motivation behind cutting a a uh, a fancy shaped diamond? Um, see, uh, from the weight retention perspective, uh, when we look at a rough piece, obviously the planning is done based on what you know. When we do multiple plannings, we we have multiple plans which get the best value. And as I told you initially, we also at that point of time with our software of light retention, we also get to understand a basic understanding of how. Uh, the make would be and how would the fire of the stone would be. So for those reasons, when we do a planning, we don't look at weight retention as the maximum priority. Yes, weight retention is important for obvious reasons because it's the value of the stone and you try to um, bring in as much as weight retention when it comes to um, getting the best out of the value of the money that we paid for the rough. But most important for us is, is the cut of the stone. And typically, that for that reason, technology does a huge uh, job of actually letting us know where we can retain the right amount of weight, but not, but um, obviously the cut primes everything in aspect. Because if the stone is cut in a beautiful manner and has the right reflection, it has the right fire, the fire, the, the exactly the great amount of luster, the stone can be created and sold even on a premium as compared to even around for that reason, if it's done beautifully. So for those reasons, um, you know, we have that, that is when there's a lot of data capturing and a lot of data analysis. And for that reason, AI takes a lot of aspect of our business to help us understand how with multiple manufacturing that we have done of the same shape across the, across the past uh, years that we now know how we can create the best make and with the best retention and get the best value out of the money that we can. Interesting. And on a related point, uh, Avi, I, I wanted to ask about um, price points because we, we know that by and large, although it's not always the case, uh, fancy shape, fa uh, you know, fancy sell at a <laughs> discount to round. Um, is um, what is the what is the importance of affordability in in fancy's demand, um, and and the, the price point issue? So to what extent do people buy it because it's um, it's a lower price point. I didn't understand exactly this question. So, so how how important is the is the price of the lower the generally lower price of uh, of fancy shaped diamonds compared to rounds for, for consumers? Uh, I don't think that uh, the price is the main things. I think the trend and uh, the trend leading the fancy shape to be more popular. It's because what I mentioned, uh, it's it's just the demand. If when you have the demand, the price is going over the round sometimes. In the same category, like I said, the price going over the, the round, which never happened in the past. So the, the demand is what uh, leading the price more and uh, the demand and the availability of the goods of the, and the supply. It's very simple. Uh, John, I think one of the, when we were preparing for this uh, webinar, um, one of the things you mentioned that was an interesting, interesting point was the, the importance of sort of value, I think the term was value uniqueness, um, where consumers, um, co consumers are, are attracted to this type of product uh, because, because it's different. Um, is, uh, is, that, is that something you can expand on? Can you be able to, to talk about that a little bit? Well, I think that um, we're seeing, you know, new generations of shoppers, <clears throat> and we're talking millennials and Generation Z in specific. Um, in two and a half years, I think Generation Z is going to be the the main uh, engagement market consumer, and they absolutely are looking for individualization, uh, differentiation, um, and as uh, more fancies come available on the market, they have more exposure to them. So with the increase um, that is happening right now, you're going to have increased opportunities, not just to see, but increased opportunities to uh, see them being worn. And I think um, uh, celebrities were mentioned earlier, influencers were mentioned earlier. 
Uh, this is absolutely having an, an impact, no different than uh, when JLo wears her most recent uh, colored diamond. Uh, you know, you see those popularities um, take, taking place in the market. So I think we do see that. And I think with the rise of e-commerce, by the way, the rise of e-commerce is one of the reasons I would, I would say it's the impetus behind um, our development of, of this cut grade for fancy shapes, you know, when you see a diamond over the counter, you see its performance relative to others. That's not the case when buying or trading online. So in recent years, we've seen digital sales increasing, especially since the pandemic. And our labs have been repeatedly asked to provide guidance about the influence of cut on appearance for all shapes. And I think that as we do that, uh, they'll become even more accepted and popular among younger buyers. And, and John, I'm, I'm curious to what extent this um, uniqueness element overlaps with 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 the lab grown question. Um, is um, is is there a correlation between people uh, wanting fancy shaped diamonds and people wanting lab grown diamonds? I think um, it's an interesting question, and uh, without getting seven layers deep into the technical aspect. Um, you know, there are two ways to produce lab grown diamonds. And one of them replicates the way that Mother Nature did it, and it produces cubo octahedral rough, which is very similar to natural octas and dodex. The other way actually produces cubic rough, which um, is more suitable, I shouldn't say more suitable, it's uh, suitable for shallow shapes. And in the past, um, as I said, the round brilliant was very profitable for producers of natural diamonds because not only is it a, a, a efficient shape for, for light performance, light return, but it also is conducive to the, the shape of natural rough. You have you know, makeables and solvables, you've got broken rough, you've got twin crystals in nature, which are great for, for shallower fancy shapes. But now in lab grown, we're seeing an entire category of rough crystal which is more conducive to better yield in certain fancy shapes. Um, <clears throat> you, you may have seen uh, some of the larger record setting uh, lab growns recently, and you'll see that they're all rather shallow shapes. Um, we're seeing unique, innovative designs, um, a step cut cross, which has a 15% depth percentage. Um, yeah. something that you really rarely see uh, in, in natural diamonds and, and other shapes that are like that. So yes, I think that they, I think that the, um, the popularity can be informed uh, in the lab grown sector just simply because it's just as conducive, um, the rough that is for CBD is just as conducive to producing that shape as it is to something with depth. Right, and, and John on the, more on the demand side as well, is there, is it, is it, is it fair to say that the, the people who want um, alternative shapes are more likely to also um, be interested in, in lab grown? Oh, I can, I can just say that we're seeing a lot of fancy shapes pass through the labs. I gave the statistics earlier. Um, I would, uh, you know, I know frontline retailers and I believe they would agree with me, but uh, you know, you could go store to store to find out um, how well they're doing among the consumer uh, populations in different areas. Right. Um, Nilesh, I, I've got a question for you about uh, how consumers buy um, uh, buy, buy uh, uh, fancy shaped diamonds. Um, is it is there a consumer who has decided, right, I want for my engagement ring, I want a fancy shaped diamond, or even I want a heart shaped diamond or whatever it is, and then that, that, that that's they, once they've they made once they've made that decision they they then go into a store and look at the different options for that particular shape or is it the consumers see rounds and fancy as all those options and this and one individual consumer could go in and just decide on the spur of the moment they want this one they want this one um is it how separate are these markets really in the minds of consumers so uh, from what uh, what we've been seeing and you know understanding from different retailers and how how they've been the consuming has been done fancy shapes it's typically uh, see in the larger stone fancy shapes that business that we're in in the engagement ring uh, business uh, customers typically are when you buy an engagement ring it's typically uh, or a solitaire for yourself you typically want to buy it either a decision for yourself 
or you're buying an engagement ring to get for your girlfriend or your wife or some somebody else for that reason. And because the value of a diamond, which is a very high investment, you typically want to be careful of what you invest in because you're going to, going to buy something and you know, you're going to make someone wear something and you don't want to be in a situation that the person doesn't like it. You know, it's something that you want to wear each and every day. So for those reasons, you always have either the girlfriend give a small hint, like, listen, I like these shapes so or this shape is my favorite or something like that, or they just be a part of, uh, the decision making. So, um, you know, so that these are the aspects that I see, but typically nowadays, like how, you know, John was talking about how Gen Z and how millennials are very involved in the fancy uh, stone uh, consumptions, they typically are very clear about exactly what they want. And that they, they do the right research, they know exactly what they want. They're very clear about their focuses in life, which is the because they want to not be the regular round shape, one stone in their finger and walk around. They want to make sure that they are, they have a style, they have a statement ring. They want to be unique. They want to stand out from everybody else. And for those aspects of creating individuality, um, you know, they are very clear about what they want and they go to the store. Yes, there are a bunch of consumers who land up going um, to get in the store, probably looking to get an emerald, but find probably may get something like an elongated gradient instead um, in those as factors. They may be a chunk of it, but today's audience is very, very clear about what they want. Thanks to a lot to with the celebrities also, because they are actually ones who are influencing everybody and that you could see in every other celebrities engagement ring, each stone, each engagement ring in the past six, whether it's Cardi B, Megan Fox, Beyonce, Haley Bieber, everybody, everybody has a different stone altogether and a different shape. And, and they're all fancies. They're not none. They're none of them are around in the last. So, so for those reasons, I feel uh, decision-making gets a little turned around by even, even the jeweler, but that's more like on the lines of in this budget, you could rather get this stone, but not typically the shape is very clear, clear in their head. Thank you, Nilesh. Just a, a, a final question. I, I'm going to leave this open to who, whichever of you would uh, like to answer. Um, the, the question of proprietary cuts, um, so you know, specific cuts that individual companies have developed. Um, uh, my understanding is that that's really a very difficult market. and There's been a lot of failures in that area. Um, again, who, is this whoever who would like to answer? What, what's, what's your view on that market? What's, uh, is, um, is it worth going into? Um, from a manufacturer's perspective, I mean, we, because coming up with a proprietary cut is a place it's very, uh, it's not just a very, uh, it's a decision of very high investment because you're going to go into something with the rough that you buy, which you're not sure about uh, how it will turn out to be. So first of all, you have to believe in the product of the proprietary cut that you're doing, which is somewhere unique as compared to the other shapes that are already existing in the market. Then not just because you are, confident about it, you have to make sure the wholesaler or the retailer who will be further buying it from you to be your distribution wing to exactly believe in that product as much as you. So for those reasons, it becomes tougher. Secondly, most importantly, is that when you land up creating a new proprietary cut, you're actually creating a new shape. And a new shape not just needs a lot of advertising and marketing, but a lot of education to create why this so-called shape is probably much better and, and it, it has to have a lot of education of itself beyond the advertising and the marketing that it requires. Also, the fact is when a lot of customers, when they buy a proprietary cut, the stone that they want to buy, they're not sure about the resale value, right? Because typically, uh, you know what you're going to get when you return a round stone or a cushion or an emerald. You know there's a resale value. So until unless... Um, the end consumer has that confidence that today, whatever proprietary ring I'm getting, is it that I'm going to get, um, you know, I'm, I, where, there will be a resale value to it, which can be coupled with the, probably the retailer that comes on board and further the retailer who's, who will probably want the manufacturer to be also involved in it because, you know, things can go wrong. Um, so those things are also a factor that could be a thing. But what if, if there is a proprietary cut comes in and there's a big chain store who also believes in it and then couples it together with the advertising and the marketing, 
or a celebrity who uh, wears it as an engagement ring and makes a style statement. So if all of these combinations come together, you can create that, but it's a tough road to take. Right. So the likelihood of that happening is relatively, in, relatively low. Abby? In the last, uh, in the last 10 years, you can see that uh, the market went more and more in the small size, in the bigger size, to the elongated shapes. If we're talking about oval, if we're talking about Persia, emerald, the unique of the elongated shape, and because of the improvement of the cut, that uh, even in elongated shape, the performance and the light returns and everything is so beautiful and much better from the past, it's leading it to, to be very popular. It's limited and it's making it unique and uh, giving good value to this stuff because uh, it's limited and uh, the rough in low, elongated, it's harder to, to find in quantity versus the square rough or like uh, John mentioned for round is the more common rough that coming and easier to make. So I see really big trend in the last decades of uh, the elongated, and I don't see I don't see it finishing. It's something that gonna continue lead uh, the market as a unique uh, trend that's not going to finish soon. Um, I like to add what Avi is saying. Um, the elongated uh, elongated cushions, elongated radians, the ovals, the pear shapes, and the em emeralds is something that we are one of the uh, leading manufacturers of all these four shapes. But these shapes that we have created is because we started, when we started creating these shapes slowly at small testing levels, and we saw a huge market uh, demand and in not just because of the demand perspective, but people really appreciating the fire and luster of these stones much better than the classic makes. And because the classic make, between the classic make and, and probably that exactly like an emerald, which was 1.3 to 1.35 ratio back in the day, today I'm manufacturing almost from 1.35 to 1.55 ratio. And where my speed spot is now at 1.45 to 1.5, which is unheard of in probably in the year of 2017, 18. And now things have drastically changed. My elongated cushions are moving probably faster than my, my regular cushion makes and my regular cushion modifies that we're doing. But that is purely because we tried a little bit and we've got a market that supported it and the demand was appreciated where I saw people buying it more faster and quicker than my regular shapes. And then I kept manufacturing more and more. Um, that is when you, this is more of improvising the existing cut. So elongating a stone is more on the lines of an existing cut is there and you've actually tried to play around with the facets and the angles to give a better fire, luster, scintillation, and all these other aspects which really make the stone shine better. But when you create a proprietary cut, that is a completely different cut. That it could be a scary part of it. But to play around with what is existing, that could be a way to improvise. I think that's more exploring an existing shape and making the best out of it. And to springboard on uh, what Melish is saying uh, appropriately and nicely, uh, I would I would also say that I I create a distinction for myself between proprietary cuts that are round and proprietary cuts that are not round because. Um, as we've mentioned, the, the round brilliant has a certain character, the 57 facet round brilliant, which has existed for 100 years, it, it has a certain character when you see it, the surface area and distribution of the facets give it a certain sparkling look. Well, you can add facets to a stone, or you can take facets away from a stone um, that's round, and it's similar to if, if you have a high school gym with a disco ball. I hope I'm not dating myself terribly here. But if you have a disco ball and you're used to what your disco ball in your gym looks like, that's kind of what the standard round brilliant looks like to culture. So if you add facets to it, it's like taking the mirrors on the disco ball and making them smaller. Well, maybe you like that, but historically we've been used to the disco ball in our gym. So that's one of the reasons that the proprietary shapes sometimes don't make it with, with, there's a couple of exceptions. The Leo is probably the most notable exception. Um, when you start doing proprietary with fancies, the creativity and the expression and the artistry that, that you can commit to your design is a completely different thing. And I'm really glad, Joshua, that you, you mentioned this because um, I mentioned that we have provided at IGI 
uh, proportions ranges to help producers understand what we have observed to be the most positive beauty components. However, looking forward, we, we want to invite innovation. So we do have a mechanism for new shapes or innovative parameters for existing shapes to be submitted so if you develop a great performing cushion, for example, that has a smaller table and different angles than the traditional, um, then there are ways to prove that using current tools and technology and such parameters can qualify for, for the top grade. Great, um, well, thanks everyone for the insights. Um, before this becomes an elongated webinar, I'm just gonna very, <laughs> very, very briefly deal with some of the questions that came in. Um, there was actually one that caught my attention uh, from Ravi Agrawal, um, which is actually a, a an interesting issue. Um, he so he asks um, that you know what what we see in rounds. I'm just kind of paraphrasing. What we see in rounds is that most consumers only want to buy triple X diamonds. Um, so adding that triple X element. I mean, this, I'm using the GIA terminology, but adding the triple X element uh, for for fancy shapes could kind of commoditize it and, and lead to a point when where the only acceptable cut will be um, will be excellent and uh, overall that will have could have a negative impact on on, on the market on pricing um, Nilesh do you have any any views on this um you know I it, to get uh, um you know, I'm at this point in time in terms of understanding the standardization of how we can get cuts to come to that. It will take us time to get everyone on board and saying like, hey, this is the standard of excellent cut for a cushion and an elongated cushion, elongated cushion and a cushion modified to a regular cushion to a cushion brilliant. There'll be different faceting and different cuts and then further different performances in terms of light luster. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy with what IGI is trying to do is because they're bringing in a cut in a, in a quicker and a faster way. And they're more ready to listen and hear our perspective because of the, you know, quick quickness in the movement of how we've been cutting our diamonds. But to get that reach there as a standardization where this is going to be excellent cut and further everyone's going to be able to make it all of them. That's a very far-fetched time. I mean, I'm not. I hope that happens because we want to make good stones in the end of the day, but it's, it's, it's something which I feel uh, would happen, but, and all roughs are not different, you know, not, not all stones need to be excellent in fancy shapes. Even the VGs and the VGs and the goods will also look good because it's the light performance, which will look important at that point in time. So how do you perform, how do you define light performance and the parameters where probably there could be a stone with lesser uh, facets but better parameters. So it's going to be a very catch-22 situation. You don't know how do you define an ID cut. So to reach there will be taking some time. Um, thank you. Uh, John, I have a question from Gary Wright that I'm going to uh, direct at you. Um, he's asking about girdle thickness. He says, uh, girdle thickness extremes on fancy shapes has been increasing in recent years. Many fancies are now cut to very thick and extremely thick. This needs to impact any cut rate negatively in any in any credible creditable system. Correct question mark. Uh, yes, the girdle thickness range is given um, in our uh, guidelines for excellent. And by the way, I can drop the um, the link to the chat. Uh, you can see the guidelines where we we've shared the flow chart, the methodology. Uh, the different guidelines that we're suggesting. And again, this is not a proportions grading system. So I, I know that the trend will be for people to look at it and those who are really strict about uh, what they believe should be included will say, oh my gosh, these are too liberal. And um, it's not liberal, it's a, it's a guideline. It needs to fit within that boundary. And then we look at it to girdle thickness specifically, yes. And there are also additional requirements within some shapes about girdle thickness in the heart shape, for example. So um, absolutely, we're, we're monitoring that. Thank you. Um, there's one question here that I can answer, um, which was, will this webinar be posted on YouTube later? Uh, yes, it will. Um, and another one, uh, someone asked, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but maybe this is a question for Avi. What, what is the most expensive fancy shape? In small size? Uh, I guess so, yes. 
In small size, like I mentioned, uh, the marquee today is at the higher demand in small sizes. When we're talking in small sizes, it's from half a car down. Have the most demand right now and uh, is the strongest. And it's a little bit uh, surprising because marquee wasn't, it was pretty much out of style for a long time. The big company brought it back. Like I said, I mentioned before, uh, all the big uh, name in the market, like Cartier, Tiffany, Harry Winston, you see that they're using a lot of uh, small uh, fancy shapes and they're creating beautiful stuff and the market uh, really supporting it. And this is creating a demand that regular other, the rest of the companies, small companies and uh, another uh, chain store and stuff like that, getting all they see that the trend working well with the small sizes of fancy and they're creating also some uh, new design with the fancy shape fancy is really popular today um and nilesh what about on the the larger sizes so above one carat but what's um i think the question was what's the most what's the most expensive um, fancy shape it's a no-brainer it's an oval it's a very very well cut oval I mean, there is there's nothing for me to say. It's, it will be the market telling me what to say. Okay. So yes. Um, um, yes. Okay, so, uh, finally, um, this was a question from Ravi Agrawal. Um, why, why is why is there still a short a lot of shortages of fancy shape polished goods, even though recently rough sales have been in a pretty high number? It's is, is that is that an artificial shortage, and is it being created by the manufacturers? Um, who are controlling the pipeline and prices at the same time? It's from few reasons. First of all, the fancy shape are more limited in rough. The rough is limited, especially when you're going to marquee to elongate it or things also change uh, of the manufacturing. It used to be some uh, goods that used to come from uh, cleavage, from... Uh, uh, and they are not existing anymore. So it's like when you want taper baguette, it's much harder. To take. They are much nicer because they are coming much more from a more healthy rough and nice deepness and everything, but uh, they are more rare. Um, the, the, the fancy shape um, also... Uh, I'm, I lost uh, the, the, my, my way of thinking. Um, I want to say that um, fancy shape in the small sizes. Can you repeat this question? So I, my mind went to something. It, it, was, it, it was about um, the control of supply and, and whether there's an, whether there's shortages of uh, fancy shape polished uh, genuine a genuine reflections of, of the market. Okay, so in the small size, especially what is my side, uh, the measurement of uh, specific stuff in the, you know, in round, you have all the sizes coming uh, equally or coming in some places, majority in fancy shape, very hard. People want specific sizes and the spe specific sizes that people want, this is the trend that uh, usually is short. Also manufacturing change. And in the past, a diamond manufacturer used to buy a bunch of fancy shape, manufacture it, get the best uh, out of that and start selling it. Today, when they're buying, they're buying according to the orders and they're trying to even keep it, uh, uh, after you getting the rough, they're sewing the rough and they keeping it until they, some order coming in and then they're making the decision what to cut it for. Like what, what's gonna be the final, uh, what I'm going to cut out from that. If it's a square shape, it's might gonna be like small Asher cut or from the same shape you can make princess, if the princess in demand for me uh, and etc. cetera. It's uh, with marquee, you can find some, uh, uh, marquee that it's in really high demand and the people to looking for the more elongated shape. So it's going to be very challenging to find quantity in that, but that's the demand. So it's going to be shorting there. Uh, 
in fancy shape it's uh challenging because it's a uh, unusual shape it's not something that uh common in in the rough so that's why it's much harder to to manufacture and to to guide yourself exactly the the technology help a lot but it's still it's coming from the nature and uh it's still uh difficult to get some uh center uh some some shape some shape is very difficult when it's getting to the what we mentioned the long gated stuff it's uh very challenging to get uh quantity and to be able to supply the demand that uh the market uh creating well thank you abby and on on that note on that note i'd like to um thank all of our panelists abby nilesh and john for sharing their insights and all of you for watching and listening we've covered some very important issues i think we've uh, we've all agreed on a few things we've all agreed that the grading is very important i think we've all agreed that that uh elongated shapes are in demand um and we'll be watching all of those very closely um the this um this episode and the previous episode will be available on the rapaport youtube page as well as on our website diamonds.net uh, but for now thanks everyone and goodbye Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, guys.